All right. Uh, we're now joined by Dave Johnson, the radio voice of the Washington Wizards and TV voice of the MLS team, DC United. Dave, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, uh, busy time of year. We got my my two worlds colliding, the NBA free agencies uh, getting going, and, and we still very much halfway through the Major League Soccer season. So uh, my galaxies are full right now, if that's even correct to say. Yeah, absolutely. Dave, you've done uh, TV play-by-play for a lot of different sports, not just the soccer you do now. You've done college football in the past, NBA basketball, college basketball, lacrosse, and obviously the soccer you do now. You've had a a stint working for the um, Caps. You hosted the show for them. Uh, Can you kind of walk us through how you got here, your entire journey from college and to where you are now? Well, and and it's what's so important for people that are young and uh, and aspiring broadcasters know that you know, I, I've always lived by a, a motto, you know, you say yes and you figure it out later. So I've always wanted to be what I am right now, a, a, a sports broadcaster. But that doesn't mean as, you know, you graduate from high school, graduate from college, that that opportunity is going to be. Maybe it will be there. And and I certainly believe there are more opportunities now than ever before because oh, yeah. uh, it, it seems like everything is streamed. Uh, keep in mind, back in my day when uh, the dinosaurs roamed the earth, you know, we didn't have... <laughs> Uh, streaming video. And and so the access to entry was not as great. So, uh, you know, uh, I'm 58 years old. 40 years ago, I I was entering college at, at, at I like to call the Harvard of North Baltimore. That's actually Towson State. Um, And it's actually now known as Towson University. But I'm looking at Towson right now because I'm about to be a senior. Well, that's a very good school. That's a very good school and very good communication school. I'll tell you why. Syracuse is uh, no question. You're probably the best communication yeah. school right but but Towson affords you afforded me anyway hands-on experience and and at the end of the day uh schooling is very important I I tell people uh somebody that once told me a boss once told me a good writer will never starve so always work on that craft so as you go into college you don't necessarily have to be a communications major you could be a history major you could be whatever and in fact it may be more beneficial uh to 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 pick another field, if you're planning to be another major, I should say, uh, if you're planning to be an on-air talent, because uh, if, if to be on the air, it, it's about experience and, and getting that that experience. So I worked. My first paid job was a, a uh, I was a disc jockey and I was playing hit parade records. They called it. It was Perry Como and Nat King Cole and, and some of the classics. So um, you know, my journey into sports, to, to make this a, a quicker story than I could certainly make it a long story and fill a half hour on it, but it, it started by just doing various um, jobs that were not necessarily sports related, but it allowed me to get in front of some people that eventually hired me for some sports opportunities. And, uh, you know, my first big, big break in, in sports was doing Naval Academy sports and then, uh, you know, doing uh, at the time afternoon sports at WTOP Radio in Washington, which I'm still at WTOP doing the morning drive, but that led to opportunities uh, that I I still have quite now, quite frankly, the Washington Wizards and, and and DC United. So um, it's, it's important for people to, to be flexible and versatile uh, if, if they want to, you know, continue on a a journey because uh, in broadcasting, sometimes you have to pivot. Right. And with the Wizards right now, and we look at, as you said, kind of the world's colliding right now. I'll be honest with you. Not a soccer guy. Never have been. But basketball. I love basketball. I love the NBA. And you look at the Wizards. They're kind of one of those teams that I feel like they're kind of stuck. Because they're not bad. They're just not on that level of contending. But they're also not a team that I can look at and say, oh, they're terrible. I have to start over. They have a guy like Bradley Beal. When you have a guy like that, you can't start over. You have a guy to build around. Rui's been all right. Avdia, I haven't seen much, but you have guys there. What do you think the Wizards need to do to kind of take that step up? Well, I I know what the Wizards need to do to take that next step up. And, you know, most teams in the NBA, or not, I shouldn't say most, but but there's a large portion of the league you could define as stuck because the way the NBA works, Mm -hmm. um, it it, it only seems to be a, a, a couple of teams are truly at a certain level um, in a given year. Whereas, let, let's say hockey, for example, it, it's more – the Stanley Cup playoffs are more unpredictable. And I we certainly know that in Washington where where the Capitals would have 
great regular seasons and it wouldn't translate uh, in, into the postseason. What the Wizards – the Wizards can be a top four team in the Eastern Conference if they are better defensively. Now, let me finish that s- sentence. All they have to do is be better defensively three or four uh, possessions a game. And, and, and what I mean is um, you know, that's how fine it is in the NBA. We're not talking – with the age of the three-point shot, you're not going to have some – super defensive team that's going to hold some opponent under 90 points a game or that type of thing. Um, the Wizards, what gives you hope that they can be in the top four is that uh, the NBA is a sport that plays with a shot clock. You're going to have to score points, and the Wizards can. Uh, t- to graduate from where they are, uh, a, a playoff contender to, to a serious playoff contender, let's say, it's, it's that fine a margin. So that's why – uh, you go into a season hoping you're one of those teams that makes that leap. And that happens in the NBA. Did anyone see Cleveland advancing to the no. level? They, well, but that's my point. Every year in the NBA, you have that that graduation, if you will, of a certain team. The Wizards want to be that team as they're constructed now because they have unique players with unique skill sets that can play multiple positions. And again, as you evaluate players, you know, a player that I definitely don't want us to see trade is is Denny Avdia, because what he has shown me, what he has shown me, forget, I don't want to hear about is scoring. What he can do, what a lot of players can't do, is defend, and what you have to do now in today's NBA, multiple positions. And if you look at over his career, young career, some of the assignments he'd been given, guys like Giannis and a few others of that ilk, he has done well. Now, when you do well against Giannis, that doesn't mean you hold him to 10 points a game. But he's going to know he's in a game by the time he finishes. That's what he's brought. So, you know, that's what they like about a Denny Avdia. You know, that's what gives you encouragement, gives me encouragement with the Wizards. The last several draft picks, all these guys are, are young. Um, by definition, draft picks are young. Some are even younger now as we live in this 18 or 19-year-old draft pick days. Uh, me. But they're yeah, but yeah. they're still they're still all. Uh, look at what Corey Kispert did last year. That he had a yeah. solid career, solid rookie season. So this is what you build on. You can't for the Wizards as I look at the last few drafts, et cetera. You you don't say wow they they have a player there that's not going to have uh, an NBA career. Rui Hachimura is able to is consistently hitting a three point shot now. That means okay, that's that's how he graduates to having an NBA career. It's not easy to make it in the NBA. And, and the great example I give, Bar- Barclays Center in Brooklyn hosted the 2013 NBA draft. That's not that long ago. There was a picture on the wall at the Barclays Center of the 14 lottery picks. So the top 14 picks of that year's draft. Maybe three are still having an impact in the NBA. So yeah, that's why I look at what the Wizards have done recently with the draft, encouraged by it. And – you know, it was Johnny Davis the right pick. You know what? We'll know in five years. Um, but but right now, by all accounts, he was the uh, the best player available at that position. Yeah, I agree. I like Johnny Davis. He's a guy. Yeah, I, I thought Johnny Davis. I mean, he definitely came up clutch a lot for um, the Badgers when he played there um, last season, especially. Uh, talking, can we shift over back to your uh, soccer? Um, I know you have some uh, interruption in the background there, uh, but just the pace of radio and basketball. Basketball is a pretty fast-paced sport. You're going back and forth, and radio is, you know, you kind of call got to call everything that's going on. You got to paint the picture. And soccer, you kind of slow it down a bit, and especially on TV, it's more, you know, storytelling, giving your color commentator some room to talk. So can you talk about, like, the differences in those two sports? Because they're definitely a unique combination. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and there's even a difference when you go from college basketball to, to the NBA. And uh, when I'll go back to calling a college game, you realize, and this is not a knock on the college game, just how slow it is in comparison mm-hmm. to the NBA. And that's a credit to the NBA having uh, the 450 best basketball players in the world and, and the decisions they have to make. Uh, it's incredible what they do in, in that, that time span. You know, soccer is just uh, is a different sport, but but something if you're if it's like anything else, if you know what you're watching it, and especially in a sport like soccer where it never stops, it never stops. There's always a potential for something to happen. It's not like um, you know basketball is 
somewhat choreographed. I mean, there's, you, you can steal in a fast break and et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of it is, okay, this team has a ball, has a chance to shoot, that team defends, it goes back and forth. Soccer is a little bit more unpredictable. And, um, you know, why the world loves soccer is because it's, it's – um, we always say we love playoff hockey because the, every goal is so important. Well, that's, that's soccer. Every goal right. is so important. You may only get one. Sometimes you get none. You know, sometimes you, the it's other night there was a slow. Well, there's a there's a four four game. But are there bad NFL games? Yes. Are there bad NBA games? Oh, I can tell you, I've watched plenty of them. Are there bad NHL games? Are there bad soccer games? Yes. But that doesn't mean the sport. You know, I've witnessed zero zero soccer games that it could have been ten to ten, and I'm not exaggerating. But the, you know, by the way, defense is part of a, a game too. So. You know, soccer, it's a different rhythm. It's a different pace, but it's not like you can relax. And in fact, in some ways, uh, it is more stressful because you just don't know when that moment's going to happen. Could be on this, all of a sudden, this turnover. And in a matter of seconds, the goal, and that's the moment. Well, what if you're talking about, you know, God knows what, then you miss the moment. So it's important in every game, you respect that particular game. Uh, and, and it is always about the game. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, it's that's definitely an interesting way to to look at it. Uh, what about so obviously you have to you don't just go to a game with nothing ready. You have to prepare hours and hours of of preparation. We had a speaker at the play by play sports broadcasting camp. I don't know if it was you, but he said it was essentially three times as much preparation that he does there. He spends three times as much time on preparation than the actual broadcast is gonna is gonna take. So, can you kind of uh, take us through what your preparation looks like for an NBA game? It's you know it really is. Uh, I don't know if I have a time. It wasn't me to put the the time ratio on it, but that's probably a fair time ratio because uh, as you prepare for an NBA game, let's say <laughs> you, you it's the old adage: the one note you don't look up is the one that's going to come up during the game. And so you'll have a thousand notes, uh, but all of a sudden that note that you need to have at that moment, you don't have. And that's, you know, that's what you don't want yeah. to Michael. Uh, happen. But I think also, um, uh, you know, we live in an age as we do this over online and the internet, um, it, it almost feels like you you never stop preparing because it could be a half hour before game time and somebody tweets something out or, or, uh, so it's, it's, there was a time when, when you felt like you're going into it prepared because there wasn't, uh, the internet, you just had to rely on media guides and, and, and interviews you did. And, and that was it. And, and the, the, the game started now, um, it, it really is. It's like peeling an onion. You peel, you see one article, which leads you to a link on another article. Um, so it, it's, uh, and there's probably more pressure to be prepared because guess what? If I'm reading those articles, every fan can read those articles. So I've got to be able to give them something they don't necessarily know. Or once upon a time, you know, when I first started this, you know, every fan didn't have a media guide or didn't have a press release or, or that type. And all that stuff is, is available online. Do you like it better like that? Or is that like something you don't like? Is that something that makes it more exciting for you? It's, yeah, it makes it more exciting. Look, I, you know, um, it's 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 not even a better or worse. It's it's the age we live in, so that's right. that's good. It it but it does make it, you know, it, it my, um, it, it makes you always on guard though, because you never yeah. know where oh so and so just tweeted out. I mean, once upon a time you didn't have to look at somebody's Twitter feed to know right. what was happening. There was no such thing. Yeah, you, you know, there was be a formal announcement, and it came by a you know, an old fashioned phone, not a, not a cell phone that we're all on. So, uh, you know, the element of surprise is more there because you don't know where, Oh, somebody just Snapchatted something. I mean, you know, th th those are not concerns we used to ever have. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's just, it puts you on guard knowing that, uh, you know, you think, you know, something and somebody will say, well, you know, so-and-so just tweeted, he's not going to be traded or, or whatever the, the point may be. Yeah. Um, Michael, do you have another question kind of about there? Because if not, I want to kind of switch back to the NBA. That's fine. Know. I was going to – I mean, I, I can ask something about soccer later if, if – you, you can go for the NBA now, back right. to the NBA, cool. I guess. So, Bradley Beal from 
a perspective of what we've seen from guys at his level, I don't know if I can point to another player that is as good as him that has been willing to stay without making it to a conference finals. What do you think it is about the Wizards, whether it's their culture or just his teammates, that's made him want to be like, instead of trying to go team up with someone else, which at players caliber definitely could, he wants to stay in Washington and try and build this, which I respect a lot about him. But what do you think it is about the Wizards that makes him want to stay? Well, I, I think he realizes that that things that ha- – and we've seen this over and over again. For every, you know, situation of LeBron going to Miami and and, a, and taking my talents to South Beach, Beach and they win a title, it, you know, how did it work out for Kevin Durant in Brooklyn? It, it right. worked out. And so the point being, I, I think he's smart enough to realize the grass, it's the oldest cliche, might not always be greener. He might think, well, I'll go, you know – team X because they want me and we'll put it together with whatever player. And it, it just is not that simple in, in, in the NBA. And so, um, so he's deciding, you know, and you know, I think it's, it's his DNA. I mean, I think we all have, um, I don't want to say these other players look for the easy way out, but there, there's some people. I'll uh, say it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they'd say, you know what, you know, I believe in myself that much that I can be part of, you know, taking this team to the next level or be a part of the solution. Um, you know, he likes it in Washington. His family likes it in Washington. Uh, as, I, as I've told people, I, I said, you, you, you're you always a player of his caliber. You're always going to be involved in trade rumors, but it never comes from uh, him or his body language or how he acts or, or uh, again, how we even got to this point. A couple of years ago, he didn't have to sign the extension he signed. And guess what? Yeah. We, we didn't because of <laughs> what a wild couple of years it's been with COVID and everything else. And I'm not making it wizards excuses. Every team's had to do with what, whatever, but it just didn't, you know, there wasn't that, wow, we're now in the top four in the Eastern conference or something. They were unable to show in that period of time. Hey, Bradley Beal, look where we are now. Um, but we are here where he still wants to be a part of it because he's not taking an attitude. Well, you know, I'm going to sit back and you show me what you can do for me. He goes out and just competes and tries to make a difference. Um, and there's players like this where you know, most players, I think, are, are like this. And, and again, this is not to be negative on any player that decides he wants to go, you know, to a different team or whatever. I, As a fan, I don't enjoy that. As a fan, I grew up with with teams that that stayed together. The players stayed together, you know, and and that, that was that may be a little bit naive, but uh, you know, I, I love that. Where, okay, we didn't get it done this year, but we're going to come back next year and, and try harder. And and that's, uh, I think people relate to that because, um, you know, that's what you in in a quote unquote regular job typically face. Uh, you can't say, well, I'm going to leave my sales job. To, you can, but you know, you might have to stay in your current job and the way you get better is you work a little bit harder and, and that's what the wizards are going to have to do. They have the talent, the whole, the, you look, every NBA team has, there's even the worst NBA team record wise, the, 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 the 13, 15 players they have are part of the best basketball players on the planet. You know, that's why whenever, you know, we've had bad seasons, the wizards have had bad seasons. They say, well, I bet you Kentucky or whoever the number one college team would beat them. Well, no, 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 no college team could come close to beating an NBA team because a good college team has, you know, three or four Duke has three or four guys that might, might make it in the NBA. That's still a high number. That's a high number. Right. The NBA has guys that make it in the NBA and guys yeah. that, that, you know, there's no part of the schedule in the NBA where, well, we're, this is guaranteed win night. Um, because if you don't bring, <laughs> the old uh, cliche a game, somebody's going to have their lunch because you know what? Um, these guys like playing basketball for a living and they know that, okay, it's great that, that, that I'm making these millions, et cetera, but there's a whole nother bunch that want my job. And that's and what know. I think you look at that too. And something that I've been kind of thinking about the last few days for, I don't even know why, but the talent level in the NBA There's a lot of players. I think the NBA is getting very close to needing 
to expand to 32 because there's so many players. And well, Seattle and Vegas, I think, are the obvious cities they're going to go to. Right. Right. No, no. Yeah. It's it's getting to a point where it is to the point, I, I would argue, because of the yeah. the international uh, influence that we've, you know, we've got so many players from so many places. And Giannis um, is going to make that bigger. Yeah. And, and, and it's. And unlike, unlike you know, we've, we've talked about soccer in this country, uh, in this uh, the show, the, the thing about soccer that sometimes makes U.S. fans hard to grasp is is in the U.S. we're used to having the best leagues, period. The, there's, not, there's, right. NFL, there's no other football league. Baseball, there's other baseball leagues, but come on, they not, not, not even close to Major League Baseball. Same with the hockey. Yeah, hockey is a world game, but, you know, the German league is not anywhere close to the NHL or or even the Russian league or, or whatever. Um, in soccer, it's not like that. You have a big five, a big five in Europe alone. And so, um, and so that's why the NBA, uh, you can make the argument is ready for an expansion because there's no other league close to the NBA. Yes. Spain has a quality league or Italy. Uh, but again, not in the same level. I I've, <laughs> been behind the mic when we've played a, a Spanish team or a, a, a team from Lithuania, which is a good basketball country. And it's, it's not even close. Yeah. Ball brothers. Yeah. Um, going back to soccer, as you just mentioned, you've been, uh, well, you've been with East United since its inception. You were been there when the club was founded in 95, right? You've been the player right. playboy since then. And, Obviously, I mean, you've grown with the team. Uh, you've also covered on Sirius XM, right? The uh, 2006 World Cup. Correct. That was a pretty thrilling World Cup. The final went to penalty shots. Um, can you, like, kind of just... It's not a super popular thing here in the United States, especially as, again, as you just mentioned, especially, like, to stick to. But you, you have. You've been with the sport, and you've been with it here for a very long time. So can you kind of, like... Talk to that, and you know what well, you have. It, with, it, yeah. it is now because um, uh, I look at Audi Field, and we have a, our own stadium, um, twenty thousand seat capacity. We we had a, I went to the game as a fan the other night, the other day, and it's twenty and thirty somethings. So the demographics of That's soccer yeah. are are tremendous. I, I, I grew up on baseball. I love baseball, but you you don't demographics of baseball are not good. When the average World Series Watcher is my age. That's not good for the for the future of the sport. So, right. Um, the, 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 there's no longer a question of is, is soccer going to make it in the United States. It's here. It is definitely here. It's part of the fabric. Uh, now, it, guess what? It's taken 40 years of a lot of work from a lot of people. <laughs> but when you have a league of, of almost 30 teams now, almost all of them have this their own stadiums. And the one that, that don't, Seattle you know, draws – 35, 40,000 a game. New England is owned by Robert Kraft. So he's got his own stadium. It just happens to be the Patriots stadium. But when you average as a league over 21,000 a game, you're major league now. I know they always like to say the four major sports. Well, <laughs> when you've got billions of dollars spent now across the country, uh, whether it's DC, whether it's outside New York and Red Bulls, or it's outside Philadelphia, the unions stay, uh, go right down the list. Um, it's it's a major league. So now yeah. it, it's a situation where in the seventies, when I was growing up, you had to explain to people, oh, wait a minute, we don't understand this game and, and it's low scoring and da, da da. You don't have to explain that now. And it's, it's look, baseball, I think is a great game, but I remember the first time I took an English guy uh, to a baseball game and he said, and, and, and you guys think soccer is boring. So in other words, <laughs> which, what you grow up with and what you understand yeah. uh, are important. And this nation now has grown up with soccer. Yeah, absolutely. We got a pretty good team uh, going into the uh, World Cup this fall. I'm pretty excited. I will say real quick, one sport that I think the way you've kind of talked about, you've seen soccer grow, and I'm sure the influence of the fact that I live in Maryland, but it's not really a sport that I love, but I think lacrosse is going to be a sport that we're going to see in the next 20-ish years take that very similar leap that you're talking about with soccer that you've seen. Again, maybe there is a little bit of that Maryland influence, and it's so huge here, even if it's not my favorite sport. It seems like there is that growth nationally. Well, that's 
No, and and there's and and see, this is the thing, and it's a great point you make. Is like what Paul Rabel is doing now with the Premier yeah. Lacrosse League, and um, and, and if people are looking for lightning to strike, it, it happens, but it, but to sustain it, uh, right. it takes a longer period. So yeah. soccer's success now in this country, uh, I'm not kidding, is forty years at least right. in the making is, is, you know, Pele came over in 75 and um, you know, that w- what has to happen is people grow up with it. Uh, and when they grow up with it, they get jobs and then they buy season tickets. Well, that's, that's, you know, it, when I was a kid, you know, I begged my, my parents to take me to one game and they went and, but they didn't know what they were watching, but they, so I got the one game, but you know, I grew up, it's the same thing with lacrosse. If you grew up with it, you understand it, you enjoy it. So they have a real chance. And, and I just know in the past 30 years, um, in terms of, you know, how they're playing out in the – there's a kid from um, Maryland. I am I'm losing track of his name, but he's done well at the University of Maryland, who's from San Diego. Well, 30 years ago, they didn't know what lacrosse was in San Diego. Now you have a player from San Diego who's playing on, you know, one of the best teams in the – over the national champions, for goodness yeah. sakes. So on the best team in the country and contributing and not just, you know, carrying the water. So, um, you know, I think sports history is, is a fun thing to look at because there are changes. There's changes in attitudes in the country. All you, This will be a history lesson. This is even before my time. In the 1950s, the three biggest sports in this country were horse racing, boxing and baseball. Right. That's not the case now. So 50 years from now. What are going to be the three biggest sports? People say, well, it's got to be the NFL. You, you don't know. It's got to be the NBA. 50 years is a long time, and a lot, lot can happen during that period of time. Agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, before we uh, wrap up, I do. I, I still have a, a few more questions. And as we have been mentioning throughout the entire show, you have done different sports for your entire career, and you've worked with many different people. Um, so how do you kind of gain that connection with different color commentators when you have so many that you've worked with in your career? Well, I, I think, um, I don't know if there's, there's, it's, it's like, I think it's part of being a good communicator is being a good listener first. So, you, you know, when, when you're, I've been put in situations where maybe I don't know this color commentator, you know, when I'd call volleyball or something, I'd be, be put with somebody that I didn't really know much about. So, it's important to get a sense of what you want them to shine because if they shine, then, you know, the whole broadcast shines and, and I think it's more enjoyable for the, the viewer or, or listener. So uh, I, I think, you know, is in, in, in communication, remember listening is such a important trait to really um, it's like when, when you're doing interviews, uh, yes, it's good to go and prepare with certain questions, but, but don't forget to actually listen because what the person answering the question will say often leads you to the next question. Whereas if you're so focused on, um, well, I've got to get these five questions in, then, then it's probably not going to be a great interview because if you're listening to the person you're interviewing says something and, and a question pops in your head, it's probably the same questions popping into the head of the viewer uh, or the listener. And so uh, to your point about, you know, color commentators, it's important as you meet them to say, all right, what makes them tick? What, what are their strong points? Um, you know, what's, what's their personality like? It's, it's not, uh, it's important that you can't um, dictate to them. Uh, well, I need you to say this and I need you to say this, this way. I always tell the story that, that um, if a consultant had gotten a hold of John Madden, we would have never had John Madden. If somebody said to John Madden, oh, you know, John, you can't talk with your arms like this and you can't, you know, go. We would have missed out on, you know, the guy that we enjoyed the most of the NFL. Yeah. And so what was what was the key? Well, they let John Madden be authentic, be himself. And that's so important. Whether you're a commentator or a play by play at the end of the day, you can't fool people. They know the real you. Absolutely. And um I am an aspiring play-by-play guy. Josh and I both definitely want to do something uh, in our lives in the sports broadcasting industry. And there are tons of people around the country and around the world who'd want to do something like us. Before we 
end off. Do you have any advice uh, for people to get to even close to where you are? Well, <laughs> you already are doing. You're doing this. This is what the, I said that 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 you know uh, the opportunity exists to um, broadcast. You're a broadcaster now. Uh, maybe right. only you know three people watch this, and I say that not because I've had my own broadcast where only three people watch, or maybe three million people watch it. it but the point being is you you put it out there, and you put it out there on a, on a consistent basis, and. Look, we we do a podcast at the DC Sports uh, WTOP called the DC Sports Huddle. I encourage people to to, to um, listen to it. But guess what? There's some weeks we don't have that many people because there's so many things right. for people yeah. to to listen to uh, and watch. But uh, I'm, I'm telling you, you're doing to anybody watching. The advice is to do, just keep doing. But keep doing doesn't mean, well, I did it for a couple of weeks and, you know, uh, it, 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 I didn't get much reaction. It, you keep doing. It. You yeah, keep absolutely. Doing. We started out with barely, you know, we started out with COVID. We got lucky. We got a few breaks. We've talked to a bunch of people in this industry and they've all um, told us some great stuff. And Dave, thank you so much uh, for joining us here. So, um, yeah, this interview will go on. YouTube, Josh, do you want to say anything before we? Uh... No, not really. This was fun. Nice for you. Yeah. Well, no, and just just remember that that uh, uh, one day I'll be working for both of you. So uh, <laughs> I, I took time out on a Saturday and and I enjoyed every moment of it. Uh, but but when you you know I need a job ten years from now, uh, please please consider me because I, you know I was nice to you. <laughs> Absolutely, I thank you.